chapter 4, verses 1 to 13. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. The next day, the rulers, elders, and teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and the other men of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and everyone else in Israel. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Nazareth whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you completely healed. He is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realised that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Wendy, for that reading. So we're continuing our series on the book of Acts, the story of us. Now, our reading today, it closed with these words. Let me put them up there again. When they, this is the members of the Sanhedrin, the religious elite in Jerusalem, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. That's a powerful verse, yes? Unschooled, ordinary men who had been with Jesus. The title of my message today is Power Greater Than Education. Let's commit this time to our Heavenly Father. Father, we thank you for this time that we can come gather around your word. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit will say. Father, we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So let's think about how this story of us is unfolding so far. Let's go right back to the beginning. Jesus came from heaven. He spoke with power and authority, and he left us with some truly amazing words. Even historians will say 2,000 years later and no one has come anywhere close to matching what Jesus taught, yes? His words speak into human con the human condition, human existence, unlike anyone else that's come after him. He also healed people, lots of people. He cast out demons, he fed the hungry and he raised the dead. And then he died for the sins of the world. And in rising on the third day, he demonstrated that sin and death have been defeated. And now he's exalted at the right hand of God the Father in heaven, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion. And then he poured out his spirit upon his people. But has anything really changed? I mean, people still get sick and die. We still see people sick and die. Billions of people are still poor and go hungry day by day. We still have violence and war and corruption. There's still injustice and greed and famine. And the evil one seems to be rampaging through this world unchecked. Think about it. What difference did Jesus really make in coming into this world? Sure, he lived amongst us for a while and did some good things, but now he's gone into heaven. Things are pretty good in heaven. 
But what about down here? What's Jesus doing about all the sin and brokenness down here? Now, if you go on the internet, that's a question that people will ask. People that reject the Christian faith, they'll ask these sorts of questions. They'll say, if Jesus is Lord, if he's conquered sin and death and gone into heaven, then, then what about down here? What about this world? Where is the promised new world that the Hebrew prophets spoke of? What happened to all their, prophes- uh, their promises of peace and justice and prosperity? Why hasn't it come? When is God going to fix all the brokenness we see in this world every day around us? When's God going to do that? That's the tension that some people can wrestle with. But two weeks ago, we looked at this healing of the lame man. He was a man who sat day by day in the temple in Jerusalem. And this is the place where Jesus had been. And despite Jesus coming into this world, right into the very place where this man was, he still can't walk, and he's still forced to beg for a living day by day. Peter and John encounter this man, and they do something Jesus did while he was here on earth. They look at him, reach out, and they heal him. And what do we see? He walks, and then he runs, and then he jumps. And then soon a crowd gathers. People see what's going on. And Peter takes this as an opportunity to share about Jesus. He shares about how Jesus was killed, but God raised him from the dead. And then he explains that the healing of this lame man is a signpost of what God will one day do in fixing all of the brokenness we see in this world around us. Yes, Jesus has gone into heaven. Yes, this world is still full of sin and brokenness and violence and death, but a time will come. A time will come when God will restore this broken world. A time will come when God will right every wrong and put an end to injustice and corruption, decay and war. Listen again to these words that were at the heart of Peter's second sermon. Listen to the hope that's contained within them. Peter said, Jesus must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore all things as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. He's saying one day God's going to fix everything that's broken. You, me, the world. But now we think about when those words were spoken, it's been almost 2,000 years. Why so long? Why the delay in coming back, Jesus? Why the delay in ending all this strife in the world? Why the delay in alleviating poverty and famine and sickness and death? Can't you see all the suffering in this world around us, Jesus? Do you know, if I had the power to fix it, I'd do it straight away. I wouldn't wait. You know, we're not the first generation to wrestle with these questions. Peter found himself dealing with this very same question in his own lifetime. Listen to these words he wrote a few years after the healing of this lame man. He said this, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some understand slowness. Rather, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but that all should come to repentance. Do you see that? And understand Peter's speaking to Christians. They also struggled with the way things were. They looked at the world around them. The iron fist of Rome still ruled. They still had plague and pestilence and conflict. And they were wondering, what's going on? And Peter's speaking into that. A few verses earlier, Peter spoke about scoffers who would say this. Where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. In other words, he's saying, yes, they're saying, yes, Jesus came into the world, but nothing's really changed. Things are still the way they always were. Where is this coming, he promised? What does Peter say? He explains the reason for this delay in coming is because God is patiently waiting for more people to be saved. Jesus has delayed his return because his church has a mission. A mission to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That's why Jesus is delayed. That's why he's still in heaven. We have a mission to go out into all the world to declare the forgiveness that's found only in Jesus. Now in our reading today, we see that Peter and John have been arrested They've been thrown in jail for the night, and then they're dragged before the Sanhedrin. Now understand, they've not done anything wrong. What they've done is a good thing. 
There's a man who's never walked in his life before. Suddenly he's running and jumping for joy. And all the crowd are worshiping God because of this. Now, the religious leaders, they should have seen this miracle of this lame man leaping like a deer as the fulfillment of a promise made by the prophet Isaiah. They should have been celebrating this amazing fact that God was at work in their presence. They should have been saying to Peter and John, hey, you need to come before the Sanhedrin and and share a testimony. Instead, what what they do is they drag them before them and say, you guys need to give an account. You need to explain what you're doing. And so the question is, why? If God wants all people to to be saved, then why is there such opposition? Why is there such opposition even from within God's own people? Let's look again at the opening verses of chapter 4. Luke writes, The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they're speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed... A miracle's taking place. People are coming to faith in Jesus. They are greatly disturbed. Why? Because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. Can you see what the problem is? Peter and John are proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. Now there's two problems here. Firstly, the Sadducees didn't believe in resurrection, but their concern here is not theological. Their concern is with the fact that they had Jesus put to death and now Peter and John are saying, guess what, guys? He's alive. This is bringing back some pretty bad memories for the Sanhedrin. Now in John chapter 11, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead and and John says this, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary, now understand they've gone for a funeral. They've gone to weep. They've gone to be with her in her weeping. They've gone for this funeral, and guess what? They see what Jesus did, and they put their faith in him. There's this movement now towards Jesus. What happens is this leads to an emergency meeting of the Sanhedrin where they openly declare. Here's what they say. Here is this man performing many miraculous signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone, everyone will believe in him and then the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Do you see what the real problem is here? It's the same as it always is. Power, greed, and control. Do you see that? Jesus was a threat to the way things were, so best that we kill him. And they did. And they thought that if we kill Jesus, then the movement around Jesus is going to die, and we'll still have our positions of power and prestige, kill Jesus, and that'll be the end of that. Or so they thought. Not only are Peter and John preaching that Jesus is alive again, there's again this huge groundswell to this movement. 5,000 men and counting, Luke says, so that excludes women and children. Can you see their predicament? Killing Jesus didn't work. People are continuing to flock to him. He was a threat to them in life, and now he's a threat to them in death. And when they ask how this lame man was healed, when they say, hey, can you guys explain to us how was this man healed? And the reason they're asking this is because like Lazarus, this is a miracle that they cannot deny. Peter says he's healed in the name of Jesus. Do you hear what Peter's actually saying? He's saying, even though you had Jesus killed, Jesus, even in death, is still performing miraculous signs. What that means is this movement towards Jesus, it's not going to stop. This movement towards Jesus is here to stay. What did Jesus say? I will build my church and the gates of death will not overcome it. The gates of death will not overcome or prevail against my impending death. That's what he's saying. Can I tell you, history is littered with examples of people who thought, you know, we're going to kill off Jesus by targeting the church. Let me, let me introduce you to this man. This man's Voltaire. He was a French uh, philosopher, an atheist. He said this, to destroy the Christian religion, we must first destroy man's belief in the Bible. And he predicted that the Bible would be extinct within a hundred years of his death and that the only place someone would be able to find a copy would be in a museum. Okay, can I tell you, Voltaire died in 1778. Do the math. 
Here we are today. I don't have to go to a museum to get a copy of the Bible. I've got one sitting over there in my phone. Now listen to this. This is a great irony. A century after his death, Voltaire's home had become the place where they were storing Bibles. Okay, So the Evangelical Society of Geneva was using his former house as a store place for Bibles. Okay, and the very same printing presses that he had used to produce his anti-religious pamphlets, his rhetoric, was now being used to print Bibles. History shows us that the Christian faith has his habit of outliving those who predict its death and decline. Now, I've shared this before, you know, the communist regime in China. If you look at what they did in the 20th century, they either killed or expelled all of the Christian missionaries. If you're a Chinese Christian, you were imprisoned, you were tortured, you were threatened about you know, speaking in the name of Jesus. So for the communist regime in China, for them, Jesus is dead in the tomb. And yet somehow, without any outside influence, the church grew in phenomenal ways. Jesus wasn't dead in the tomb, he was alive on the inside. And estimates suggest there could be as many as 50 million uh, Christians in China today. The fact is this, it doesn't matter what the world throws at Jesus or his followers, this is a movement that cannot be stopped. It cannot be stopped because Jesus is alive. Amen? Amen. Even here today in the West, can I say, don't believe everything you hear in the media. Christianity is not dying in the West. Now, I don't have time to go into all the details, but I can assure you there's a groundswell of belief amongst young people today in the West. Let me show you this man, Michael Bird. He's an Australian theologian. In a recent article called The Surprising Rebirth of Belief in God, he said, a lot of people are realizing that a Christian-based society is better than a caliphate or rainbow Stalinism. Now, by that, he means all this gender and sexual ideology stuff. They're realizing that spirituality is better than living through our devices in some technologically infused hedonistic landscape. Now, there's a lot there, so I'll leave it up. You're getting the gist of what he's saying. You might have heard of Richard Dawkins. He wrote a book called The God Delusion. You heard of Richard Dawkins? Okay? He wrote The, the God Delusion. Even now, he is arguing that cultural Christianity is better than the alternatives. Okay, the guy who's arguing in his most famous book that God is a delusion, he's now coming to realize that what the world offers as an alternative, Christianity is offering something better. That's his position now. The alternatives have been tried. He's saying they're being found wanting. The Jesus movement is a movement that cannot be stopped. So here's Peter and John. They're standing before the Sanhedrin. The high priest is there, members of his family are there. Now understand, these are the same men who condemn Jesus to death. So Peter and John, there's, there's very, very little expectation that they're going to get justice. And there's the very real fear that they could suffer the same fate as Jesus. Understand this. They're being called to account. There's a very real thought in their mind that we too could end up crucified at the hands of the Romans, just like our master. And so they're asked, explain how this healing took place. Understand, it's the same question that Jesus was asked when he was performing miracles. And, and, and in trying to explain, what's the accusation from the religious leaders? He's doing what he's doing through the power of the devil. It's by the hand of Beelzebub that this man drives out demons. So they're on a hiding to nothing. So here they are. What are, what are Peter and John going to do? Are they going to buckle under the pressure? Are they going to cower under the fear, of, you know, the, the fear of death? You know, what will they do? Maybe they'll deny Christ like they did before. Let's read from verse 8 of our text. I love these opening words. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. There's no, there's no backing down. There's no cowering in fear. 
Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Can you see how bold and defiant those words are? These people could have them killed. And what does he do? He doesn't mince his words. He is bold because he's filled with the Spirit. Think about this. The worst the Sanhedrin can do is put them to death. But the resurrection shows that death has lost its sting. The ultimate weapon the Sanhedrin has is death, and that weapon has been disarmed. They can kill Peter and John, but one day God will raise them to new life. That's why the resurrection is such good news, yes? The worst the world can do is kill us, but God raises the dead. That's why Peter can stand there defiantly and boldly and speak into them like this. Death has lost its sting. It's like they're holding a gun that shoots only blanks. And Peter says, Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Now this is a quotation from Psalm 118. Now do you realize this? These are the words that Jesus himself spoke to the chief priests in the days leading up to his death. He spoke these words a few days later. They crucified him. In fact, immediately after speaking these words, I think it's Matthew says they sought to arrest him. Can you see how Peter's not mincing his words? He's not pulling his punches. He's filled with the Spirit and he is bold. So what do these words mean? Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the, the capstone, the cornerstone. Verse 12 helps us understand Peter says, Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no other other name, sorry, in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Put simply, what it means is this. God is building his kingdom in this world on Jesus, on who he is and what he's done. And Peter says to the Sanhedrin, you rejected this guy and you crucified him. And the stark reality confronting them is the same stark reality confronting us today. It is Christ or nothing. Christ or judgment, Christ or a lost alternative, Christ or hell. That's the same stark reality that we face that they faced back then. Now words like that today can get you in trouble, yeah? They're considered arrogant and politically incorrect. You're probably familiar with the expression, all roads lead to Rome. You heard that before? Or all pathways lead to the top of the mountain. We live in a modern pluralistic society. What that means is this. There's so many faiths out there, and because of that, it's considered arrogant and even hateful to claim that we alone have the truth over and above other religions. Can I tell you, it was true then and it's true now. And it's true, it was true then in a world that was even more religious than we are today. They even had altars in Athens to an unknown God. You know, the Christians were considered atheists because they didn't worship all the gods. They were a deeply religious, uh, pluralistic society. So that claim to exclusivism is even more bold today or just as bold as it is today. We okay? So the question is, how can we be sure? How can we be sure that we have the truth that others lack? Look at the context. No one else died and rose again. The leaders of every other world religion died, and guess what? They stayed dead. No one else has done what Jesus has done. He alone rose from the dead, and he alone was exalted into heaven. Look at the response from the Sanhedrin. Verse 13. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and took note that these men had been with Jesus. Now, there's two very interesting words here to describe Peter and John. The first word is the word for unschooled. It's a grammar toy. Now, can you see the word grammar? Can you see the word grammar there? Okay, it relates to formal education. So we have Guilford Grammar School here in Perth. Okay, it's a place of formal learning. And in Greek, you can see the A in front of the word. That functions to negate the meaning. So in other words, unlike the members of the Sanhedrin, Peter and John, they haven't actually received proper training in rabbinic theology. Okay, they're guys who are unschooled. They're unlearned. The second word is uh, self-explanatory. 
Can you see the word there? It's the word we get idiot from, okay? Peter and John are idiotai, okay? Simply means they're simple men. They're peasant fishermen from Galilee. So in the eyes of the religious elite, guess what? You're nothing. You're ordinary. You're idiotai, okay? And yet these very same people looking at them thinking they're idiotai, they're astonished. Why are they astonished? They note that they've been with Jesus. They have a power that's greater than education. Now, you may have heard the name of Smith Wigglesworth. You're familiar with Smith Wigglesworth, okay? He was a British evangelist. He, too, was unschooled. If you read his story, as a young child, he firstly worked in the fields pulling turnips, and then later he was working in different factories. As an adult, he worked as a plumber. He was illiterate until after he got married, age 23. It was his wife, Polly, that taught him how to read. He was an unschooled, ordinary man, but guess what? God used him in mighty ways. God did amazing miracles for him. Read his, read his works. An amazing man of God. Now, there are many famous quotes that are attributed to him, and you might know this one. He said this, God does not call those who are equipped. He equips those whom he has called. Now, please hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying there's no place for formal theological training. I think we'll all agree the church needs people who are well-trained, who can teach the Bible with clarity and understanding, yes? But more than that, the church needs people who are filled, yes? Don't believe the lie that God can't use me because I haven't been to Bible college, okay? Don't believe that lie. Let me say this, it's not about the vessel, it's about what's in the vessel, Can I say that again? It's not about the vessel, it's about what's in the vessel. I can tell you from first-hand experience that spiritual power doesn't come from intellect and head knowledge. Spiritual power comes from being filled with the Holy Spirit. It comes from being with Jesus. Now, if you're a Christian here, that means you have the Spirit. Every single one of us has the Spirit, which means we can be used by God. Amen? But the danger is sometimes we're running on empty. That can be the problem. The problem is you've not had formal training. The problem is sometimes we can run on empty. I can tell you, I speak from experience. I like this quote from Christine Kane. She says this. I think surely, sorry, we think surely there is someone more qualified, better behaved, someone who has stronger faith than we do someone more extraordinary than us. But the truth is, God has only ever used ordinary people to accomplish his purposes because he has only ever created ordinary people. Don't look at someone else and say, God, of course, can use them, but he can't use me. I'm too ordinary. No, that's not it. God's desire is to take simple people idiotai, people like Peter and John, people like you and me, fill them with his spirit and empower them to do extraordinary things. Don't sit there and say, I'm too ordinary for God to use me. The only thing that will stop you from being used is if you're running on empty. Be filled. We okay? Luke writes that the Sanhedrin was astonished by the courage of Peter and John. Okay, the man who they miraculously healed is with them, so there's nothing they can say. So what they do is they order them to leave. The Sanhedrin takes time to deliberate. What are we going to do? Eventually, Peter and John are commanded uh, a call back in, and what they decide is this. They command them to no longer speak or teach in the name of Jesus. Can you see what they're doing? They're saying, we want you to stop the movement. Stop talking about Jesus. Stop this movement. This prompts the famous reply. Judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God, for we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. In other words, they're saying, we can't stop bearing witness to Jesus. We can't stop talking about Jesus. And that's what's going to happen when you're filled. When you're filled with the Spirit, no one's going to be able to stop you. You're going to want to naturally talk about Jesus. So I suppose the flip side of that is this. How often do you share your faith? How often do you talk about Jesus? 
maybe that could be a gauge of how much we've been filled. They're then threatened and released, and let's pick things up in verse 23. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and to perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they had prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. That's some powerful stuff right there. Do you notice what they didn't do? When arrested and threatened, they don't complain about what's happened. They don't go onto social media and play the victim. That's such a big thing these days. If you've been offended, if you've you know, had something done against you, you go to Facebook or you go to Instagram and you put it out there for everyone to say, oh, poor you, you're the victim. They don't do that. Instead, they get together and pray. And do you see what they pray for? They don't ask for protection. They don't ask for political power. They don't ask for God to stretch out his hand to smite the religious leaders. And they don't even ask, where is God in the midst of this intimidation and opposition? They don't say, God, we've been rejected. Where are you? Instead, what they say is this. God, we know you were sovereign. You made all things and you have power over everything that has happened, even the death of Jesus. You foretold through David that the rulers of this world would plot in vain against you and your anointed one. That's their prayer. That's their belief. And that's the answer to the question as to why this world continues to be broken. People are living in defiant rebellion against the Creator and against His Savior. And so how do they pray? They say, Lord, despite what we see around us, we know that you're in control. So stretch out your hand and perform more signs of wonders more of the thing that got us into trouble in the first place. Because, Father, we know that if, if more miracles are done, more crowds will gather, and that will give us more opportunities to share about Jesus, and more people by your Spirit will come to be saved. That's their prayer. Are you with me? God, give us more opportunities to do the things that bring us in conflict with the religious leaders so we can share more about the glory of the risen Messiah. God, do it. Stretch out your hands. I love it. And the room where they were was what? Wasn't quiet. It was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Not just Peter and John. Not just... The 12, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they all spoke the word of God boldly. Now this is the first time we get opposition in the book of Acts and what do they do? They continue to speak boldly. Listen to these words from John Piper. He says, life is war. That's not all it is, but it is always that. Our weakness in prayer is owing largely to our neglect of this truth. Prayer is primarily a wartime walkie-talkie for the mission of the church as it advances against the powers of darkness and unbelief. He goes on to say, It is not surprising that prayer malfunctions when we try to make it an intercom to call upstairs for more comforts in the den. God has given us prayer as a wartime walkie-talkie so that we can call headquarters for everything we need as the kingdom of Christ advances in this world. The fact is, this is showing us that the kingdom exists in a hostile world, yes? 
And our call is to reach out to a lost and broken world that rages in vain against its creator. And prayer, this gift of prayer, it's a walkie-talkie that connects us with strategic command so that we can set about our mission. It was never intended only to be a vending machine where we just get more creature comforts. It's about connecting us with Jesus so that we can be with him, just as Peter and John were. And when we are with him, guess what? We are going to be filled. Ordinary people, simple people, idioti, filled with God's spirit, empowered to do extraordinary things. But we're just a, a group of old people. What can we do? We can't do much. We can do much. We can pray, yes? We can pray. Do you believe in the power of prayer? Yes. Let me close with this exhortation. How is your prayer life? How often do you pray? Smith Wigglesworth said this. He said, I don't pray for more than half an hour when I pray, but I don't go half an hour without praying. Constantly, always prayerful. What do you pray for? Someone I know said this recently. He said, I believe that when we get serious with God, God listens. When God listens, he does stuff, yes? And I like this model of corporate prayer. God's people coming together to seek his face, to petition him to see thy kingdom come. This afternoon, we're hosting a time of prayer. It's three o'clock. It's just over there in the fellowship hall. Okay, we're going to pray we're going to seek God's face. We're going to petition him. We're also trying to shape a, a prayer vision for the church, the life of the church. We'd love to see you there. Let's close. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that even though we live in a world that is fallen and broken, we can see the evidence of rebellion against you, the creator. Every single day we see it around us. You've equipped us to be your people through the outpouring of your spirit, to be involved in this mission of calling people to come to faith in Jesus Christ, the one who will one day come to restore all things. But you are not slow to act. You are waiting for more people, Father, to come to faith in Christ. And so, Father, help us to be a people who adopt a, a wartime mentality that we have this gift of prayer, this walkie-talkie to commune with you, to see thy kingdom come. Help us to be like Peter and John, bold and filled with your spirit, because we're people who spend time with Jesus. Father, we thank you for the precious gifts you've given us to fulfill this task you've given us. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.